Chapter 6 of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 6 Our new conductor, just shipped, had been without sleep for twenty hours. Such a thing was very frequent. From St. Joseph, Missouri, to Sacramento, California, by stagecoach, was nearly nineteen hundred miles, and the trip was often made in fifteen days. The cars do it in four and a half now. But the time specified in the mail contracts, and required by the schedule, was eighteen or nineteen days, if I remember rightly. This was to make fair allowance for winter storms and snows, and other unavoidable causes of detention. The stage company had everything under strict discipline and good system. Over each two hundred and fifty miles of road they placed an agent, or superintendent, and invested him with great authority. His beat, or jurisdiction, of two hundred and fifty miles was called a division. He purchased horses, mules, harness, and food for men and beasts, and distributed these things among his stage stations from time to time, according to his judgment of what each station needed. He erected station buildings and dug wells. He attended to the paying of the station keepers, hostlers, drivers, and blacksmiths, and discharged them whenever he chose. He was a very, very great man in his division, a kind of grand mogul, a sultan of the Indies, in whose presence common men were modest of speech and manner, and in the glare of whose greatness even the dazzling stage-driver dwindled to a penny-dip. There were about eight of these kings, all told, on the overland route. Next in rank and importance to the division agent came the conductor. His beat was the same length as the agent's, two hundred and fifty miles. He sat with the driver, and, when necessary, rode that fearful distance night and day without other rest or sleep than what he could get perched thus on top of the flying vehicle. Think of it! He had absolute charge of the mails, express matter, passengers, and stagecoach until he delivered them to the next conductor and got his receipt for them. Consequently, he had to be a man of intelligence, decision, and considerable executive ability. He was usually a quiet, pleasant man, who attended closely to his duties, and was a good deal of a gentleman. It was not absolutely necessary that the division agent should be a gentleman, and occasionally he wasn't. But he was always a general in administrative ability, and a bulldog in courage and determination. Otherwise the chieftainship over the lawless underlings of the overland service would never in any instance have been to him anything but an equivalent for a month of insolence and distress, and a bullet in the coffin at the end of it. There were about sixteen or eighteen conductors on the overland, for there was a daily stage each way, and a conductor on every stage. Next, in real and official rank and importance after the conductor, came my delight, the driver. Next, in real, but not in apparent importance, for we have seen that in the eyes of the common herd the driver was to the conductor as an admiral is to the captain of the flagship. The driver's beat was pretty long, and his sleeping time at the stations pretty short sometimes. And so, but for the grandeur of his position, his would have been a sorry life, as well as a hard and wearing one. We took a new driver every day or every night, for they drove backward and forward over the same piece of road all the time, and therefore we never got as well acquainted with them as we did with the conductors. And besides, they would have been above being familiar with such rubbish as passengers, anyhow, as a general thing. Still, we were always eager to get a sight of each and every new driver as soon as the watch changed, for each and every day we were either anxious to get rid of an unpleasant one, or loath to part with a driver we had learned to like and had come to be sociable and friendly with. And so the first question we asked the conductor, whenever we got to where we were to exchange drivers, was always, which is him? The grammar was faulty, maybe, but we could not know then that it would go into a book some day. As long as everything went smoothly, the overland driver was well enough situated, but if a fellow driver got sick suddenly, it made trouble, for the coach must go on, and so the potentate who was about to climb down and take a luxurious rest after his long night's siege in the midst of wind and rain and darkness had to stay where he was 
and do the sick man's work. Once, in the Rocky Mountains, when I found a driver sound asleep on the box, and the mules going at the usual breakneck pace, the conductor said never mind him, there was no danger, and he was doing double duty, had driven seventy-five miles on one coach, and was now going back over it on this without rest or sleep. A hundred and fifty miles of holding back of six vindictive mules, and keeping them from climbing the trees. It sounds incredible, but I remember the statement well enough. The station-keepers, hostlers, etc., were low, rough characters, as already described, and from western Nebraska to Nevada a considerable sprinkling of them might be fairly set down as outlaws, fugitives from justice, criminals whose best security was a section of country which was without law and without even the pretense of it. When the division agent issued an order to one of these parties, he did it with the full understanding that he might have to enforce it with a Navy six-shooter, and so he always went fixed to make things go along smoothly. Now and then a division agent was really obliged to shoot a hostler through the head to teach him some simple matter that he could have taught him with a club if his circumstances and surroundings had been different. But they were snappy, able men, those division agents, and when they tried to teach a subordinate anything, that subordinate generally got it through his head. A great portion of this vast machinery, these hundreds of men and coaches and thousands of mules and horses, was in the hands of Mr. Ben Holliday. All the western half of the business was in his hands. This reminds me of an incident of Palestine travel which is pertinent here, so I will transfer it just in the language in which I find it set down in my Holy Land notebook. No doubt everybody has heard of Ben Holliday, a man of prodigious energy, who used to send mails and passengers flying across the continent in his overland stagecoaches like a very whirlwind, two thousand long miles in fifteen days and a half, by the watch. But this fragment of history is not about Ben Holliday, but about a young New York boy by the name of Jack, who traveled with our small party of pilgrims in the Holy Land, and who had traveled to California in Mr. Holliday's overland coaches three years before, and had by no means forgotten it or lost his gushing admiration of Mr. H. Aged nineteen, Jack was a good boy, a good-hearted and always well-meaning boy, who had been reared in the city of New York, and although he was bright and knew a great many useful things, his scriptural education had been a good deal neglected to such a degree, indeed, that all Holy Land history was fresh and new to him, and all Bible names mysteries that had never disturbed his virgin ear. Also in our party was an elderly pilgrim who was the reverse of Jack, in that he was learned in the scriptures, and an enthusiast concerning them. He was our encyclopedia, and we were never tired of listening to his speeches, nor he of making them. He never passed a celebrated locality from Bashan to Bethlehem without illuminating it with an oration. One day, when camped near the ruins of Jericho, he burst forth with something like this. Jack, do you see that range of mountains over yonder that bounds the Jordan Valley? The mountains of Moab, Jack. Think of it, my boy. The actual mountains of Moab, renowned in scripture history. We are actually standing face to face with those illustrious crags and peaks, and for all we know, dropping his voice impressively, our eyes may be resting at this very moment upon the spot where lies the mysterious grave of Moses. Think of it, Jack. Moses who? Falling inflection. Moses who? Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of such criminal ignorance. Why, Moses, the great guide, soldier, poet, lawgiver of ancient Israel. Jack, from this spot where we stand, to Egypt, stretches a fearful desert three hundred miles in extent, and across that desert that wonderful man brought the children of Israel, guiding them with unfailing sagacity for forty years over the sandy desolation and among the obstructing rocks and hills, and landed them at last, safe and sound, within sight of this very spot and where we now stand they entered the promised land with anthems of rejoicing. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, Jack. Think of it. Forty years? Only three hundred miles? Humph! Ben Holliday would have fetched them through in thirty-six hours. The boy meant no harm. He did not know that he had said anything that was wrong or irreverent, and so no one scolded him or felt offended with him. 
and nobody could but some ungenerous spirit, incapable of excusing the heedless blunders of a boy. At noon on the fifth day out, we arrived at the crossing of the South Platte, alias Julesburg, alias Overland City, four hundred and seventy miles from St. Joseph, the strangest, quaintest, funniest frontier town that our untraveled eyes had ever stared at and been astonished with. End of chapter 6